Okay. Can, I, can everybody see my screen? It's loading, but I think I, I can see it. Okay, good. Okay, just one minute. Let me tell my, uh, just get everything quiet. Okay, here we go. Um, no. uh, you're in psychology in the Paris system. The new trend is that everything is standardized. All of the diagnoses are standardized. So for pap smears, we use Bethesda system, uh, thyroid Bethesda system, uh, salivary gland. Yeah, but most likely, inshallah, have a bardu A. Milan system, everybody will go with it. The idea is that we provide a uh, basic kind of uh, system of diagnosis. So they know what each of these mean uh, based on, uh, you know, research, the behavior of each of those levels. And, um, and they know how to, how to treat it. Yeah. So the parent system is interesting because uh, it's, the main purpose of it is to detect the high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Uh, just one. The voice is not uh, on anymore. Uh, sorry. Yeah, okay. So the main purpose of uh, the Paris system is to say whether or not there is high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Uh, so the uh, purpose is different from what we are used to. Yeah, we are pathologists, we are going to see what we are seeing. No, in the Paris system, we say, we say what we don't see. We are not seeing high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Is it high-grade or not high-grade? So let's start with the overview of urine cytology. Okay? So for urine cytology, you have a number of different specimens. You can either get it as avoided urine, clean catch. Uh, the problem with this one is that there is, uh, it's common to find um, uh, uh, contamination from the uh, genital urea, urinary tract, like the uh, squamous cells. In uh, Hagathenia, in the first morning, the dip, uh, like the, the urine has spent overnight within the bladder, so there's some degenerative changes. Catheterized urine has a problem of instrumentation, so it's very common that you'll find uh, lubricant, you know, and lubricant, uh, depending how much lubricant it can be, uh, it can get interfere as well as that it's been at room temperature bardo, so this can cause some uh, element of, um, of degeneration. Uh, the upper tract uh, washings and brushings, once again, this is an interest, instrumentation. However, um, the instrumentation is more of benign clusters, so it makes the cells cluster into, uh, into balls or different shapes, uh, what they call benign tissue fragments. Um, you can also find some mild uh, cytologic atypia, which is related to stones that are in the upper urinary tract. Uh, and generally saying uh, it is absolutely impossible to diagnose the low-grade lesions, particularly in these kinds of, of specimens. Bladder washings is another example of an instrumentation. Uh, this one has better cellularity and cellular preservation. Thus, uh, it's uh, the same kind of thing. You can find a lot of these uh, instrumentation kind of uh, uh, artifacts. Uh, we uh, can mention the ileal conduits, so the patients that have had a uh, bladder removed for uh, invasive carcinoma, uh, a portion of the colon is used as, uh, sorry, a portion of the ileum is used as a temporary bladder, okay? 
And this is very common to see a whole lot of these degenerated urothelial cells along with sometimes uh, some of the, um, what's it called, some of the intestinal cells some of, uh, and, some, and some of the urostomy, like if there's a stoma, uh, adhesive material. Um, so once again, this is from the Bethesda book, uh, and it shows you the different advantages and, and low and, and disadvantages. Uh, so uh, the voided urine is that it's the easiest. It's very easy to continue to get specimens. The disadvantages, like we said, is that there's some um, GU or uh, genital contamination, like vaginal contamination, poor preservation. Catheterized urine, um, high cellularity is the advantage, but the disadvantage is the instrumentation artifact. Uh, bladder washing is actually maybe one of the best. High cellularity, good cell preservation. Thus, there is the instrumentation artifact. Upper tract, we mentioned. Uh, brush cytology, we don't really see very much. And the ileal loop uh, is uh, uh, also helpful for screening purposes. Now the concept of adequacy has not really been assessed very well. It doesn't have enough data, but we can say uh, there is recommendations put in the Bethesda book that, um, sorry, that any abnormality is considered adequate. So even if you have a few cells, if you find you know, one that is convincingly a malignant or whatever, then yes, you can consider it an adequate uh, specimen. Uh, instrumented urine, they put a, a recommendation of 2,600 cells or two per 10 pi haver field. And voided urine, they only gave an amount. So the amount of over 30 mLs is better. So um, this is the adequacy algorithm. So depending on whether or not, so like we said, if you see anything atypical or suspicious or malignant, then yes adequate. If it's, uh, we don't see anything, is this instrumented? If yes, then accordingly you would assess. If it's not instrumented, you try to see if there's anything that is obstructing uh, the view or not. So that is an overview of the sources of uh, urine cytology. Preparation of urine cytology, uh, I'm not sure where it's done late, uh, elsewhere, but most places in the U.S., they use thin prep or cytospin. Both of them have general same concept, which is um, when, the, when the cells are spun at a very high rate, they can be transferred onto the slide. It's just a, it's just a matter of the different kinds of, um, of uh, what's it called? Different kinds of approaches or procedure uh, that they have. Uh, and I'd like to know when we're finished, you can tell me how most urine is processed in Egypt. I'd be interested in knowing uh, that. So cytology statistics, let's talk a little bit how good this is. Uh, indications, the most common indication for urinary cytology is hematuria. Interestingly, it is only caused by malignancy in about 5% or 10% of patients. So, so the second most common is surveillance for urinary carcinoma. Uh, and generally speaking, if there are patients that have a risk factor for bladder cancer, they can also begin screening early on. Um, the sensitivity is quite, it has a very wide range. So from 37% to 89%, low grade is less sensitive than high grade, which is why we use it for, um, and this is one of the main reasons that the Paris system focuses on uh, urinary cytology as a high grade screening test. It's not a screening test that is very good for low grade, but it is very good for high grade, okay? So this is an example of, um, as you can see, this patient has, um, uh, you can see all the blood cells here, and you can see a very atypical cell uh, right here, and we'll talk about uh, the ratios and the diagnoses. It is also very expensive. About $4 billion each year are spent on cancer uh, surveillance, and it is expensive cancer over the lifetime, especially nowadays that uh, patients are living longer and they are more, um, uh, and they have better uh, care. Other uh, kinds of screening tests, in addition to cytology, uh, these ones can be done within uh, the lab, BTA, uh, NMP22, uh, and FISH Eurovision. A lot of patient places, they combine the cytology with the Eurovision FISH, and that improves uh, the, um, the level of sensitivity, in particular for low-grade lesions, okay? Uh, Vanilla urothelial carcinoma. 
So your ethelial carcinoma, 3% of all cancer-related deaths. Uh, it's three times more common in, your, in males. It occurs in more than 50 years old, usually. There are some, shh, use the phone, quiet. Um, sorry, my kids are kind of interfering. Uh, risk factors, smoking, occupational agents we mentioned, taman uh, schistosoma, uh, and then there are paralysis and diverticula. So there's two main pathways, okay? So the first main pathway, which is more common, is the hyperplasia. <clears throat> this is 80% of cases. And basically what happens is that there's urethral hyperplasia and then the low grade, and then, and then uh, that low grade just continues to recur. Uh, this uh, pathway is related to CDKM2A uh, as well as some um, protein alterations, and these are found in low grade. This is a non-aggressive, um, non-invasive. The other pathway, which is the non-papillary pathway or the dysplasia pathway, this is less frequent, uh, occurs in 20% of urethial carcinomas, uh, and this is for the high grade or the flat carcinoma in situ. This is related to P53. P53 and about 60% of high grade. It has a high rate of recurrence. I'm sorry, just a minute. I'm going to just tell my kids to leave the room so that I can um, give less of a lecture without any noise. Okay? Just a minute. Okay. I'll come back. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. So, uh, as we mentioned, this is related to P53, and this is about 60% uh, of the high grades. Uh, there's a high risk of uh, progression into um, muscle invasion and so on. Uh, there is a percentage of cases that are mentioned through the hyperplasia pathway that can undergo a RAS mutation and then become high grade. Okay. okay, so this is basically uh, a quick overview of the different kinds of urethral carcinoma. And now let's talk about the Paris system. So the Paris system, basically, what happened is that in 2013, you have about uh, 49 members from uh, 20, from nine countries, uh, the majority looks like from the US, etc. And they all came together. Uh, to form the working system uh, to find, to make a standardized terminology for signing out your uh, urine cars, urine uh, cytology, and they made seven different groups. So the first group is that it's non-diagnostic or unsatisfactory. Second group is that it's negative for high grade NH. The third group is called atypical. The fourth group is called uh, suspicious for high grade. Uh, the fifth group grade the first one is high grade. Six is low grade, and then other is other kinds of um, malignant neoplasms. The idea is that the clinical uh, follow-up is different. So this management was uh, adopted by the European uh, Urological Society. Um, I'm not sure if the American Urological Society started it or not, but generally speaking, the more uh, it takes on in different areas, more the majority of institutions have begun using Paris system, and it's expected that the, the American Urological Society will adopt this as well. Basically, if it's unsatisfactory or non-diagnostic, they will repeat the cytology and cystoscopy in three months. If it's negative, then they follow up. If there's atypical, they also follow up, and they could potentially use things like the fish that we mentioned. Suspicious and uh, onward is much more aggressive. Okay, so starting with suspicious, uh, there's a 50 to 90% uh, risk of malignancy, at which point there is much more aggressive. There's cystoscopy, biopsies, uh, etc. Okay, so it's like there's one line that goes across right here between 
the uh, less aggressive and more aggressive follow-up. So now let's go ahead and uh, talk about the different groups. And then, so negative for high grade. Uh, negative for high grade uh, uh, now includes a whole lot of things that were originally considered atypical. So it used to be, if you saw, uh, for example, stone-related atypia, you would call it atypical uh, atypical uh, um, atypia, right? Uh, now we don't consider it atypia anymore. It is considered negative for high grade. It's just negative, okay? Mm -hmm. So that is the main difference because a whole lot of these ones that used to make the atypical category really big We've now made the atypical category much smaller, and we'll talk about how to how to uh, di how to uh, the criteria for atypia, and the the category of negative for high grade is much larger. Okay, so this includes viral changes, uh, stone related changes, treatment effects. Right, um, we mentioned the benign tissue fragments as well. Uh, as well as things that may not really belong, like squamous cells, glandular cells, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so unexpected normal cells that you might find, uh, the ileal uh, cells, all of these are now considered negative for high grade. So let's talk about the different components that you can see that are considered negative for high grade. So to understand the components of the general uh, cells that you see in, uh, in urine uh, cytology, you have to remember the histology, where you have the basal cells, intermediate cells, and umbrella cells. Uh, they used to call this transitional um, epithelium. They don't use that term anymore, but it was considered transitional because it was somewhere in between, um, you know, it's similar to squamous, but not really. So they considered it was like in transition. Uh, the fact of the matter is that it's, it's now its own entity of urophilia, pretty much. Umbrella cells, these are the ones at the top, these are the ones that are exposed the most to urine, and so they can be very large, they can look very strange, you can have lots of binucleation, etc. Um, the, uh, and then going along, you can see the smaller, the more smaller cells until you get to the basal cells. Uh, that have a smaller NC ratio, but you will notice that they look very normal, very flat, very rounded uh, borders, uh, and you can tell that these are all benign, okay? So, uh, and then in between, you have uh, the cells that are uh, in between basal and umbrella, where they're starting to, to slowly become, uh, you know, uh, increase their cytoplasm uh, and have slightly larger nuclei. So uh, basal cells are common to see in the instrumentation, like we said, things like the uh, bladder washings and the catheterization. You'll see what we call the benign tissue fragments. Now, can you see glandular cells? Yes, glandular cells actually are considered uh, normal. Uh, you can find it as uh, the remnants of the ure urecus. You can find them as cystitis cystita, cystita or glandularis. Sometimes you can find renal tubular cells. Uh, generally speaking, uh, they either look like they're histiocytes or they look like they're gland, gland cells. And you can also find things from the surrounding organs, such as the seminal vesicle, prostate, endometrium, endometriosis, and the ileal uh, conduit. So if we look here, sometimes you can recognize it very easily how they have that kind of uh, glandular uh, look to them. Um, here's another example where they look almost histiocytic, sort of, you know. Uh, depending on how you, if you see it in cross section or uh, or not, when they start to degenerate, they can look kind of scary because they start to look very dark. But you could still appreciate a bipolar uh, access to it, um, and sometimes they can even have vacuoles that are very large. But you could tell this is a degenerating cell as well because the nucleus is so dark. So uh, glandular cells, generally speaking, if they look benign, then guess then we just call them, like we said, negative or high grade, nothing to worry about. Squamoid cells, this can happen due to squamous metaplasia, or it can come from the urethra, or it can have from uh, vulvovaginal contamination. So this one, for example, is vulvovaginal contamination, and you can see how it has clue cells uh, remember, clue cells are uh, infection by uh, Gardena, Gardenella vaginalis and other uh, other types. 
Um, occasionally, you can actually see uh, changes of like low grade, high grade for uh, like as if it was a pap smear. Uh, urine is not meant to be a pap smear, so you're very, very, what's the word, cautious before you give any kind of diagnosis like that. This one, for example, um, this is trichomonas, believe it or not. So this patient actually has trichomonas in the background. So um, let's see, degenerative changes. Degenerative changes are really important just because they are everywhere. You see them in practically every single urine cytology specimen. These bright pink ones, these were uh, named by somebody, by Dr. So it's not very clear. Walenska and Dr. Melamed. So Dr. Melamed and Walenska, they wrote the paper. And here it's like these bright pink globules that can look very large. Um, you might think they think, uh, it, it, make sure you don't think it's like a virus or anything. It's just, you know, degenerative changes. Uh, other changes, vacuolar de degeneration, you can see that like the glandular cell that we mentioned a little bit before. Um, here's some more kind of strange looking uh, evacuation. Corpora amylacea, uh, these are just, um, and these are casts, for example. Uh, these are also just degenerative kind of processes. Uh, it helps to remember the process of degeneration. So uh, any nucleus, when it's undergoing degeneration, can go through different phases, depending on when you see it. So nuclear fragmentation, when you start to see the nucleus fall apart. When it starts to shrink and get really dark, remember that was pycnosis. And you can have it start to kind of fade away and have like little uh, nuclear fading. So if you keep that in mind, you can kind of appreciate the different phases of um, with degeneration. So for example, this, this cell is getting very dark, but you can see how the nuclear membrane is incomplete. It's degenerating. So that's not exactly the cell that you want to evaluate uh, any kind of abnormality. This one too has nuclear fading and the membrane is um, degenerating. So uh, always keep in mind that degenerative uh, changes can be misleading. Benign urethelial fragments. So uh, benign urethelial fragments are these 3D fragments that can be sheets or groups. Generally, if it's benign, you'll have a very smooth contour, uh, a centrally placed uh, nuclei. It's very common, like we said, in voided urines, uh, in, sorry, in uh, instrumentation. Um, uh, with stones as well. Uh, stones are not really something that we focus on much, but if there's different kinds of stones and there's different kinds of uh, their, uh, the way they would look like. Um, generally speaking, uh, it is very, uh, very difficult to say if this is coming from a papilloma, uh, a low grade, like a pun lump, or even a low grade urethelial carcinoma. And we'll talk in a minute about what, how to diagnose a uh, low-grade you know. But uh, mainly, so that's why we don't really worry so much. You could have a range of, um, of slightly uh, of, of atypia, including a bit of uh, pleomorphism, et cetera. So, um, and they can take all kinds of different ranges of uh, morphologies. Um, but uh, the main thing is that you notice that they are um, that they are benign, okay? Uh, but they are difficult. I'm not saying that they're easy, uh, especially when there's a lot and uh, there is an element of atypia. You almost feel like you want to call it something, but then you read Masan that the patient has uh, kidney stones, and then you realize that this is just you know more of a reaction. Organisms, yes, you can see lots of organisms. Uh, bacteria, cystitis, very common, but you will see a large reaction of neutrophils. Uh, now remember, uh, urine is a very common um, medium. It's a bacterial growth medium, so it's very common to see lots of bacteria that is just contaminant. So you won't see, if it's contaminant, you won't see uh, the body reaction. You won't see the neutrophils. Candida, yes, candida is also very common, whether it's coming from, uh, usually from the, uh, the general tract, uh, and sometimes it can be contaminant. So this is probably contaminant, well, maybe not, I don't know. There's not a lot of neutrophils, there's a couple. Could be real, could be contaminant. Um, schistosoma, this one, you guys are experts on this, not me, because you see this more than uh, anybody else. Um, now, uh, let's talk a moment about uh, 
polyomavirus. Now, polyomavirus is actually uh, present in almost 95% of people that can be seropositive. And intermittently, in 0.3%, you will actually see it in the urine. Okay, uh, its importance is it causes a loss of transplant in about 50% of the transplant patients for kidney. Okay, and it can look very similar to uh, malignant cells. And they use the word decoy cells. And decoy comes back from a long time ago when people used to go hunting. You uh, thought, you know, in whatever, whatever. We hug to Haga Shabahil Bata. Okay, so they put a, a pretend duck, you know, and then they'd, and then when they put the pretend duck, all of the real ducks come and they surround the pretend duck because they think it's a real duck, and that's how they can catch them. Now, of course, you can buy a fancy pretend duck if you want for $39 and use that instead. Uh, just kidding, of course. <laughs> okay, so polyomavirus has a very classic, uh, distinct kind of look to it. It has margination of the uh, nuclear, nuclear rim and a glassy, they describe it as being glassy, kind of uh, picture of the nucleus itself. So, uh, but it definitely looks larger. The NC ratio of the cell is big and it can look scary, but you notice this glassy as if you're looking at a frosted glass, like as if, um, you know, you have some glass and it's, uh, it's kind of foggy muscle or then that's a good way of, of describing it. We mentioned already that you can see things like uh, HPV changes or even trichomonas. Um, uh, like I said, uh, be cautious in that. Uh, and what else here? Yeah, and CMV as well can be seen. Treatment effect is another area of, uh, of atypia, of, sorry, of uh, negative for high grade. So negative for high grade will also include radiation atypia, uh, BCG immunotherapy, which will have things like the multinucleated, uh, you know, uh, uh, multinucleated uh, umbrella cells or whatever, um, <clears throat> intravesical injection of uh, thiotivomycin C causes harmful multinucleation inoculation. Uh, there's also laser treatment, fulguration, which has like a spindling of the nuclei. Uh, that can also be seen, and there's also there's also um, hold on just a minute. Okay, yes. Yeah, so um, what they call guar gum. So guar gum is actually a portion of the adhesive which is used uh, to fix the opening or the stoma of an ileal conduit. Um, and it can look almost like, you know, take the shape of schisto, but it's, it's not, obviously. Um, so that is also very common to be seen um, in, uh, as part of the, the treatment. Other common findings that are also considered negative or high grade include crystals, uh, which are beyond the sphere of this. I'm not going to go through the different kinds, um, but uh, also casts uh, and the different kinds of casts. Uh, and then you have airborne contaminants like pollen, which could be just, you know, like I said, because it's been outside for a while. So that was negative or high grade. Moving to atypical, atypical uh, uh, of uh, atypical urethelial cells. So atypical urethelial cells, basically they have two, uh, one major and one minor criteria. So the major criteria is the NC ratio. The NC ratio has to be more than 0.5, okay? And it's not, uh, it is non-degenerated uh, and it's not a superficial urethelial cell. Uh, and then from the minor ones, you either have nuclear hypochromasia or you have irregular membranes, or you have coarse chromatin. So if you look at this cell, this is a good example because it's almost exactly 50% of the cell, right? Um, there is, uh, so it has a high NC ratio, uh, and it's a little bit hyperchromatic, but maybe not completely, but it does look like it's having a coarse kind of chromatin pattern. So this one would fit the criteria for atypia. Suspicious for high grade, moving upwards. Suspicious for high grade, it goes 
one step higher than the atypia. Okay, so instead the atypia was 0.5, the uh, suspicious for a high grade or high grade has to go up to is between the 0.5 and 0.7 ratio. Okay, so you have to go higher. Uh, if you look at this one, can you see how this is definitely more than 50% of the cell? Um, and it has to have the other high and major criteria is that it has to be hyperchromatic. So those two are the two major ones. So and then plus one minor, plus or minus. So coarse chromatin and irregular nuclear membranes. So if you look at this one, like we said, you see the increased uh, NC ratio, and you also see the increased hyperchromasia. And of the minor criteria, I would say that this one actually has both of the minor criteria because it looks to me that this is irregular kind of membrane and it's kind of coarse, okay? Uh, there's also a number associated with suspicious, which is uh, five to 10 cells. So your cutoff is 10 cells. If it's more than 10, then you can feel comfortable in calling it high-grade urothelial carcinoma. So the high-grade urothelial carcinoma, very similar to what we just said in the, in the suspicious for high-grade. Uh, <clears throat> same thing that you have to have both the high NC ratio, uh, but it has to be more than 0.7, okay, uh, and the hyperchromasia, and then one of, uh, of the minor ones, which include either irregular, of course, chromatin, and then there are other things that are not part of the criteria, but you can look for, which help uh, kind of indicate that this is a, um, a high grade. Um, so uh, urine cytology cannot distinguish between the invasive type of high grade from non-invasive or in situ. However, it is said that uh, carcinoma in situ would, have, uh, would be much more clean without abundant uh, inflammation or cell debris, as opposed to um, uh, frank invasion, which would have more necrosis, which makes sense. For so if we look at this cell, you can see how large it is. You can see the increase of the NC ratio. Um, this one maybe is still at like 50% and it's not very hyperchromatic. Uh, let's see, this one perhaps um, over, let's move over. This one you can start to preach more of the frank malignant kind of features, including things like mitoses, uh, very large uh, abnormal um, irregularities, and, and even nucleoli can start to show up. Uh, let's see, this is another example, obviously. So if it's frankly malignant, it's actually not as difficult, but we have to always remember uh, our differentials. So this one, uh, once again, I think we saw this one before. Uh, increased NC ratio. This is the one that was suspicious. It's the same case. Now you can see how there are many more. Um, let's see what the background is over here. So this one you can start to appreciate kind of debris in the background, um, lots of blood, uh, and you can uh, possibly uh, in a patient with uh, invasion. Now low-grade urothelial carcinoma is unique because uh, the only way you can diagnose it with the Paris system is only if you see the fibrovascular core. And if anybody sees the fibrovascular core, please take a picture and send it to me because I don't know anybody who saw it. But uh, maybe somebody has seen it because this, this, this page is from the Bethesda book. So you see the tissue fragments, but you don't really see the fibrovascular core. So this was an example of the closest we can kind of find, but even this group would not be enough to call a low grade because it's just not clear enough. So it's, it is a category in Bethesda, but it's not common that you would see it. Most of the times you will see these uh, fragments and if they fill the criteria for, for um, either atypia or suspicious for high grade, they would fall in these two categories. If you find the fibrovascular core, then yes, you can put it in the low-grade category. Primary, secondary, and metastatic. So non urothelial bladder tumors uh, are less common. Of course, this is here in the U.S. Uh, in other countries, like in Egypt, it's, it's different. So you have uh, the non urothelial epithelial tumors, which are squamous, adeno, and neuroendocrine. Uh, non urothelial the non-epithelial ones. And then you have direct extension from prostate, colorectal, uterine, as well as metastatic. And then you have things that are tumor-like, 
So let's talk a moment about squamous cell carcinoma because you guys see this um, more than more than we do. The problem with squamous cell carcinoma is that you cannot give it um, a definite diagnosis that this is squamous cell carcinoma of the urinary bladder. And the reason is that uh, it could be um, coming from the uh, GYN, right? It could be metastatic, uh, and it could be squamous differentiation. So the urethelial carcinoma can undergo, can uh, have squamous metaplasia. Um, so in the U.S., it's 2, 2 to 5 percent of all malignancies, 10 to 20 percent of muscle invasive. The non biharzial type is in the seventh decade, and that's associated with things like urinary stasis, chronic irritation, um, Middle East and North Africa, schistosoma. This represents about 20 to 30 percent of bladder malignancies uh, worldwide. This also occurs in more elderly people, males more than females, um, and like we said, the differential diagnoses. So we all know what uh, squamous cell carcinoma, you know, looks like, and like I said, you guys are the experts. Um, let's see. I think there's this was one case where there was, um, yeah. So you can start to see the irregular kind of uh, nuclei and the orangophilia of the keratinization. And um, right here, this is the schisto eggs right here. So um, let's see what else. Like we mentioned, you could have focal squamous, um, squamous changes in your field carcinoma. So this is a case of your field carcinoma. And over here, you can start to appreciate the um, the orangophilia and the keratinization, same uh, sort of um, uh, sort of thing. And just a moment for uh, Theodore Bilharz. Oh yeah, here's the schistosome that's in the urine. Um, so Dr. Bilharz, he uh, was uh, went lived in Egypt from 1825 to 1862, and he actually unfortunately died of typhoid fever. <laughs> And he's actually buried in Egypt, which is also very interesting. Um, okay, adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma is another one where it can be either arising from within the uh, urinary bladder, like the urachus. If you guys remember the urachus and development, it's lined by, um, um, by these kind of glandular cells. Or it can arise from metaplasia. So the ur ur the urethelium undergoes metaplasia, like cystis glandularis, etc., and then it becomes um, adenocarcinoma. So here you can kind of start to appreciate the glandular appearance. It doesn't look like adeno anywhere else, which is when it does uh, balls up. Um, prominent nucleolus as well. Uh, okay, so there's different types, the NOS, the mucinous and the signet ring, and the clear cell type. Um, and these are some of the, um, the immunostains that can be used uh, to distinguish them. Neuroendocrine tumors, common, not common. Well, they are there. They're less than 1%. And they have, you keep them in mind when you see like very small round uh, blue cell, a small round blue cell tumor. Uh, crush artifact. Otherwise, they look very similar to uh, small cell carcinoma anywhere else in the world with the molding, the uh, salt and pepper chromatin kind of homogenous pattern. And if you did a cell block, I don't know if you guys do cell blocks. Most places do not do cell blocks on urine cytology unless um, they find something very suspicious. Uh, Non-epithelial. Okay, so this is also from the Bethesda book. Uh, things like Leomar sarcoma, sarcomatoid carcinoma, uh, anything else that, you know, even schwannoma. Now, direct extension is important because that is also in the differential. And this is one of the reasons we said it's hard to say if this is squamous cell carcinoma or even adenocarcinoma from the, uh, the bladder itself, unless you see um, characteristics that let you know that this is most likely okay this looks like prostate or the patient has increased PSA in the blood or uh, has a history of poorly differentiated so this one um, the location also can be helpful the prostate carcinoma will involve the neck and the trigone right and it will look very similar to colonic okay colonic carcinoma or adeno and uh, there's another subtype which can be um, 
small and kind of round and dark. Um, uh, this is where a sublock can come in useful because you can actually do, um, you know, an immunostaining on that if, uh, if, if necessary. Uh, so these are 2% of the urinary bladders, which are either METs or direct extension. Uh, the fundus uh, is common for colorectal, and this can be almost impossible to distinguish from your theocarcinoma. Um, once again, it could be helpful if you have a history of the patient. Uh, urine and cervix, like we said. Um, interestingly enough, P16 is positive in 37% of squamous cell carcinomas of your filial origin. So um, that's uh, interesting. So that's not going to be very helpful if you were trying to do immunostains to distinguish them. Now, METS is the other one. Uh, METS, about 2%. The most common site is that of... Uh, the uh, the colon, and then after that, prostate, rectum. Um, these are secondary tumors. So breast carcinoma, yes, you can see breasts. For all intents and purposes, this could be, you know, this looks almost exactly like your ethelial. I mean, if you just had that without the history, um, it would be very difficult. Lymphoma, uh, lymphoma, once again, it's it can be, uh, this is also from the book, this is Fuse Large B. Uh, maybe the smaller lympho lymphomas are less common. Uh, melanoma, this is from also the Bethesda book, so always think of melanoma. Uh, melanoma, of course, here in, in the Western countries are more common just because of the, uh, you know. So, uh, but still, it's important to keep in mind because it mimics everything and anything. Renal cell carcinoma, yeah, you can see renal cell carcinoma. Here you can appreciate this kind of frothy, material and renal cell carcinoma can uh, it can be kind of hard to uh, you might think of even a histiocyte because it looks so foamy so other things are like theochromocytoma parganglioma adenoma amyloidosis let's talk about ancillary testing real quick so ancillary testing uh, we mentioned the fish the fish is um, so the statistics say that positive fish is about 26% of patients who are otherwise uh, have a negative cytology, et cetera. 50 to 80% of these patients with positive fish will develop your uh, will develop a, a recurrent carcinoma. Um, Eurovision, um, they are testing uh, chromosomes. Let's see. So deletion for low grade, they look for the deletion of P16. High grade, they look for one for three, uh, which is very common, three and seven, and 17. And the company's Eurovision. And um, let's see here. So this is an example. Uh, this is also from the Bethesda book, so you can um, see, but over here you can appreciate uh, the chromosomal abnormalities that uh, can be seen. I'm not very good at fish, so somebody else maybe better to explain that to you. Now let's talk about practical, practical steps. So when you come to look at any um, urothelial, uh, at any cytology specimen, um, you keep a few things in, mo uh, in mind. Uh, where, the first is the where, how was it, uh, where did it come from? So if I see that it came from catheterized urine or bladder washings, then you know, I won't be surprised if there's all these cell clusters and so on and so forth. Um, if there's uh, lots of squamous cells, you know, I know that's from voided urine, et cetera. So when you know what to expect, that is very helpful. Uh, next, uh, well, these clusters, are they abnormal or not? Um, what is the ratio of the cell? Is it 0.5 or 0.7? Do they have any more of the minor criteria, like hyperchromage or regular borders? Um, how many of these cells are there? Uh, a couple things to keep in mind, that there was a study that morpholo morphologically, people have a tendency to overestimate. So we have a tendency to see things a bit higher um, than like a computer might see it as. But this is a very good article if you wanna just look at the different ratios. So 0 0.7, 0 0.8, sorry. Thank you. 
So, uh, and that's just something to keep in mind that we have a tendency to see things a little bit larger than what they are. So this is a 0.5 cell. For me, I would say, well, it almost starts to look like a little bit more than 0.5. Um, but actually, according to this computer, it's, it's 0.5. So let's look at this. This is a really good algorithm that is in the Pathesca book. And it starts off with uh, atypia. Okay, do we have atypia? Yes, I have atypia. How atypical is it? Is it less than 0.5 or more than 0.5? Okay, so it's more than 0.5. Does it also, is it also hyperchromatic? Does it have coarse chromatin? Is it irregular? If yes, let's look and see if there's a reason. Was there treatment? Was there uh, stones? Was there anything else? Yes? Okay, and let's put that in the negative for high grade position. Okay? Um, what if there's no reason for this atypia? Okay, in that case, you can say that it is atypia, right? Remember, the ratio has to be more than 0.5. Um, now, let's say that we can see some atypia, and it's in a cluster. And does it have fibrovascular cores? Yes, it does. If it does, then guess what? This will be one of the rare times that you can diagnose low grade. What if there is no... Um, no fibrovascular core, but it's atypical. The NC ratio is high, uh, higher than 0.5. Uh, well, we can check the clinical information, and most likely it would be negative for high grade. Now, what if it was much higher atypia? The NC ratio was much higher. It was more than 0.7, and it was hyperchromatic. Plus, it was either coarse or it had an irregular chromatic clip. Then what are we going to do with that one? Well, we'll see the quantity. If they're less than 10, then we can call it suspicious. If it's greater than 10, then we're gonna call it positive, okay? So this is a really good algorithm. Uh, I'm sorry, just a moment. All right, sorry, yes, the use of it's Hubbard, Manish. Um, okay, so we have a bunch of pictures here, but actually what I want to show you before we end, since there's not a lot of time, is this one. The Paris uh, system has a really good website. Now, this website is, um, it was, it's related to Wisconsin something, uh, the University of Wisconsin, but it has a lot of these images that, uh, you know, uh, really good to self-test. Um, I recommend that everybody kind of uh, tests themselves on this one. So let's let's do this one together. Does everybody have a chat box? You can open your chat box and we can see um, if all of our answers are the same or different. Okay, so this one is an 82-year-old with hematuria. Um, so we see it's like a cluster, and uh, it's very coarse. There's an increased uh, NC ratio. Look how, how, how huge these uh, cells are. And uh, the question is, which one of this, these Paris criteria do we think uh, this would be? Is this negative, low grade, atypical, suspicious, or high grade, or other? So go ahead and put your answer. Mm. Can everybody see the chat box? I'll post something in here. Mm. How can we put the answer? Um, so if you go to chat, the chat box, group mm -hmm. chat. Do you see the group chat? Yes. Okay. So just put your uh, put your answer. Okay. Well, looks like it's not working. Um, 
Hmm. Let's just say, uh, okay, so which one do you think, uh, Dr. Nfisa? I think this looks like a high grade. Yeah. So when you press submit, it gives you uh, all of the interpretations. So you'll find that 76% of people called it high grade and 12% uh, for example called it uh, uh, suspicious and so on. And then it gives you an explanation of why this is considered high grade. Uh, now urine cytology is hard, it's not easy, but uh, and the only thing to do is really practice. So I recommend that all of your, uh, this, your uh, the diplomats and doctors to go through this exam, 25 questions, and do it many times, and that'll be, um, and that will be very helpful. And then, okay, so that's all yes. uh, the presentation. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. That was nice. Uh, for your question, uh, we do uh, urine cytology uh, as uh, normal um, uh, 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 slides and a thin preparation and we look at both of them so that we can we don't interpret the thin preparation as very uh, cellular because if you if you see the slides that are um, uh, you can see how cellular the uh, the urine cytology is okay and then the thin prep is um, is it hologic the company I'm sorry you know the name of the company of the FinPref? Is it Hologic? Um, I'm not sure, but I can uh, look at the. Uh, I can see what uh, what. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Okay. And then it's stained with uh, pap, pap stain. Well, what kind of stain do you use? Wallahi, in the what we use the H and E. I know that uh, the pap stain is better, but the, most of the time we use the H and E. Okay. Well, بالنسبة للpap pap smears, G Y N pap smear. Hey, do you use any prep to remove it, or will it be a part of the The pap smear, most of the time, it comes as uh, slides, so we just uh, stain them. Okay. All right. Okay. But. So uh, in urine cytology, uh, sometimes it's very difficult because with uh, hematuria, uh, the cells are very atypical and uh, maybe not because they are malignant, but because of the irritation of the uh, blood. So it's sometimes very difficult to interpret. Uh -huh. I see. Um, do you do the rehydration method? There's something called rehydration for... Um, the smears that are done uh, that have a lot of blood in the background. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I can send you the protocol. It's very easy. And um, the blood gets washed off and then you can really see the cells much better. Okay. So that will be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, we, do, we do that for, actually we do it with all of our, our FNAs and everything. We do rehydration so that uh, it's easier to interpret. Okay, shukran. Uh, we do also sometimes cell block, but uh, only in the cases when we can find the pellet or uh, if there is something in the um, urine that we can take and put it as a uh, cell block, not in all cases. I know some people do it for all cases, but we don't do it for all cases. Uh, what about like fish testing? If you have the Yamil fish? No, I don't think so. Okay. Not in our hospital, at least, because we don't have the fish for anything. So if we need the fish, we uh, we send it. But uh, for cytology, we don't do it. Uh, only, <coughs> and we do the fish only for the uh, for the uh, the breast cancer. Uh, we do the fish, not the fish. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Pap smear is much more intense, yani, but it'll probably take two over twice, maybe. Um, uh, for May, and inshallah, maybe the first, the beginning week of June, uh, if we have a lecture, we can do it. Otherwise, we'll a different system on September, inshallah. Inshallah. 
But if you can, if you want to give the pap smear, I think it's very interesting to most of the people. So if you are ready to give it in June or or something, we can any arrange it. I, I don't mean if in, nobody will hear, but I mean people are more enthusiastic during the winter time. Okay, no problem. Thank you very much. Okay, yalla, have a good day. And you too. And uh, tomorrow is uh, Easter in Egypt, so happy Easter for everybody. Yes, you could have Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Mommy, I'm